Thank you. Thank you for this uh, opportunity to, to chair this uh, panel number four. So um, I'd like to welcome now uh, Martha. Um, Martha Chaitlin, do I pronounce you Chaitlin. properly? Thank you. We just met. <laughs> so Martha is now an independent scholar, uh, but previously an assistant professor of Japanese history at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, she's the author of uh, many uh, uh, publications. Uh, one of them is Cultural Commerce and Dutch Commercial Culture, the Impact of European Material Culture on Japan, 1700-1850, which is a very, very exciting topic <laughs> that I'm looking forward to uh, to uh, ask you questions about. She, Marta also wrote a number of articles on Japanese, Japanese material culture and interaction with the Dutch. Uh, she is also the translator of the four, uh, probably already out now, a uh, memoir of C.T. Asendelft uh, de Koning, the pioneer in Yokohama. Uh, and uh, are you still writing a book on ivory trade? I is am, out yet? but I'm going to, it's not out, but I have a, several articles. Okay. And uh, I'm writing a book on shoes. On? Shoes. On shoes. On okay. Shoes. There's another one on ivory trade and consumption in, it's hard. in Asia. <laughs> it's a big topic. So she's going to talk today uh, about raising birds for pleasure. That's the title. Aviculture in Edo, Japan. The floor is yours, Martha. Thank you. Well, that, that was an old version of the title. Um, let's see if we can get the PowerPoint up. Yeah. Because originally they asked me to do something about imported birds again, but I already wrote about that and I never listened to what people tell me to do. So I'm writing about chickens instead. Um, but you will see they are just as transcultural as any other bird. Ah, there it goes. Oh, nice. I can do my own. All right. So, um, I got really excited about chickens and wrote like 40 pages. Um, and so I had to sort of brutally cut this down to fit the time period. Oh, the title isn't coming up. That's odd. Um, anyway, it's called Deviation by Design is, is my main title. And I had to sort of brutally cut this down so it will seem a little clunky. And if there are questions, I mean, because of continuity or anything, please feel free to ask them because this was rough cutting it down. All right. So the Japanese relationship with nature is, is often kind of depicted as, as unique, especially sensitive and harmonious. And that's, you know, despite the ubiquitous use of paddy agriculture that requires extensive manipulation of the environment to flood, drain, and irrigate for rice cultivation. So um, elements of pre-modern culture do emphasize the cycle of nature and harmonious coexistence, but equally strong is this tendency to shape nature, not just as a necessity of producing a staple food like rice or shelter, but in a variety of non-functional -fun expressions. So um, Japanese, there we go. So this is just a random Japanese garden. Um, but as you'll see, as you can see, um, they aren't laid out with a formality of traditional Western landscaping, but nevertheless involve careful planning, shaping, and staging. Plants do not grow like that. Um, so this, this tendency is equally true for animates like goldfish. Um, and they were imported from China, but um, Goldfish breeders develop forms like um, the nanchu, which is the one on the right, and the um, tosakin, which is the one on the left, um, because they didn't have very much glass, and these looked more attractive when looking down in opaque containers. So in Japan, no animal shows more of this propensity to manipulate nature for human needs and desires than the chicken. It provides an excellent case study for investigating the human desire to change nature for our own ends. Their meanings and their cultivation provide a window into consumption, consumerism, aesthetics, and amusements of Edo period Japan that show local specificities, yet supersede regional and class barriers. So what is a Japanese chicken? Well, 
um, take a good look at this chart. There, today there are approximately 50 breeds of chickens in Japan, but chickens are not indigenous to Japan and were never really wild. There might have been some feral, feral ones, but they weren't wild. So this chart shows most of the breeds that I'll talk about today. Um, these 17 breeds have been designated by the Japanese government as natural monuments of Japan. Um, two of these breeds, the top two, exist, have existed for a millennium or more, but 15 of them originate in the Edo period and were specifically bred, imported, and crossbred to create new gallicinaceous forms. So um, chicken bones have been found in um, late Jomon period sites, maybe 1000 BC to 300 BC. Um, but there's not very much additional evidence before the Yaoyoi period, which is about 300 BC to maybe 300 or 350 of the common era. So some researchers have sort of postulated that there were multiple introductions of chickens from the continent. Um, and I cut this, but the, the believed origin of the modern domestic chicken is believed to be in Southeast Asia, um, the red jungle fowl. Uh, with possible additions by the great jungle fowl. Um, so um, the earliest chicken breed in Japan is called the Jidori. And if you go to the supermarket today, you will still see that on packages. And there are four sec separate subspecies that have been identified based on region, um, Ise, Tosa, Gifu, and Aizu. So chickens, um, especially roosters, had divine attributes. Their perceived role as bringers of dawn and messengers to the gods made them an integral part of religious praxis. Um, chicken haniwa, um, these were um, found in tombs of the Kofun period, which is like 250 to 538. Um, and they, they don't really know the exact reason that they're in there. There's a lot of speculation. but. They're the second most common animal form after horses. So ancient texts relate that when the sun goddess, Abaterasu, hid in a cave, she got in a fight with her brother. We've all done that, right? Um, she got in a fight with her brother and hid in a cave, throwing the world into darkness. And they did a bunch of things to lure her out, which you can see in this print. But one of the things that they did was bring a rooster, which you can see next to the dancer, um, a rooster to crow to convince her that morning had arrived. Um, that didn't quite work, but that's another story. So another example of, of um, religious praxis um, can be seen in um, Tamanooya Shrine in Yamaguchi Prefecture, which is um, dedicated to a, a goddess named Tamanooya no Mikoto, who created the imperial jewel, which is um, like a kama-shaped jewel, Magatama, to, which was also to try and lure Amaterasu out of the cave. So um, they keep um, chickens at this shrine. Um, so here's another picture, and you can see the chickens in the background. Um, but the um, the kind of chickens that they, you can see they're all black. They, where is it? The Kurokashira. So I did this fast, and things are out of order, so I apologize. But anyway. You'll see it when we get there. So Kuro Kashiwa chickens are kept at the shrine in connection with this myth. Um, it's unlikely that the Kuro Kashiwa were the original birds. Oh, I know it's here. Where did it go? We'll find it. Um, anyway, it's unlikely that they were the original birds um, because they were developed from the Issei Jidori in the Edo period. Um, and they're sort of this beautiful black, greenish black bird. But it is a semi-long crowing bird, so it's kind of appropriate to this tribute to the, the event of the cave and the mythology. So um, chickens are kept at a number of other shrines around Japan, um, many of which I list in the longer version, but especially those dedicated to Amaterasu. There are also a lot of folk traditions about chickens. Um, so for example, it was believed that the crow of a rooster would keep evil away. Um, by the early Edo period, um, chickens appeared on these votive plaques called Emma, and people write their wishes on the back, as you can see in the middle. And um, it, previously, they had only depicted horses, but from the Edo period, they start showing zodiac animals like chickens. 
But chickens were unusual in that most of these animals were alone. But chickens often appeared in family groups, in pairs or in family groups, um, usually with three chicks, um, because that was thought to be sort of the ideal family size, um, which brought safety for the family or prosperity for the children. Now, most of these are modern versions. I could, because they're sort of burned at the end, it's hard to find old ones. And so I guess in modern day family, it's one chick. So I just put, this is an Indo where you can see the three chicks um, that I'm talking about, just, just to show that I'm not lying. Okay, um, so a pair of course was for conjugal happiness. Um, a chicken could be a cure for eye diseases. Chicken MO were also used to pray for an end to night crying, child, with diseases or just the general health of, of the children. So um, roosters were also associated with Kuldin, which is the god of fire and the hearth. And perhaps because the cockcombs resembled um, flames, chickens were there for protective spirits for the kitchen. So chicken Emma were also used to pray or used to pray to Kuldin. And it was even believed that um, if you had this picture of a chicken in your kitchen, it would get rid of the cockroaches. So roosters also play a, a role in Buddhist belief, appearing in a number of um, jataka. Like there's one where uh, the, a cat proposed to a rooster who was the Buddha, um, hoping to lure him into security so she could eat him, but the Buddha was way too wise for that. Um, uh, and sometimes the rooster in Buddhism had negative con connotations like in uh, Tibetan Buddhism, it was a representation of greed, lust, or attachment, which were um, the three poisons that caused suffering. But perhaps because Buddhism came to Japan through China and Korea, which had more positive views of chickens, very, very few of these negative depictions are found in Japan. Uh, so several temp temples have chicken, chicken even in the name, um, like uh, kesoku, like chicken foot. Chickens had special significance as one of the 12 signs of the zodiac, and they were also used to denote hours of the day, days of the month, and years. There are various beliefs surrounding, these, these various beliefs surrounding chickens evidence how integral this non-indigenous bird had become to daily life. Now, um, one important religious expression was cockfighting. And cockfighting was originally a divinatory practice at shrines based on Chinese yin-yang principles. Roosters were yin, or light, and so brought abundant harvest and good fortune. The tradition was brought from China as early as 462, but by the Nara period, it was popular among the elites, especially as an amusement for child emperors. Cockfighting was part of the annual rituals of the imperial house. If it rained, the event was even held indoors, and in some cases, the wings of the chickens were, or the roosters were perf perfumed, and the talons were painted bright red. Um, it is perhaps inevitable, as you can see from these prints, that cockfights sort of devolved into gambling events outside of the elite. And sometimes it was even, they were even sort of a party game where the participants were divided into right and left, where the losers of the series of bouts would then have to perform like a funny dance. Um, so if you look at these prints, um, we'll come back to the one on the right in a minute, but um, the one on the left, you can get a sense of, of how popular it was because men and women are watching the, the cockfight together. So um, with winning or losing on the line, human in engineering, of course, turned to chickens. And during the early hand period, um, the shokoku, which is this chicken, was brought from China by Tang emissaries. Um, the shokoku is also characterized as a long crower and is larger than most of the indigenous or indigenous like Japanese chickens. Um, as greater contact with Asia and widespread co cockfighting led to the importation of the shamo. And this is a very interesting chicken, specifically for um, cockfighting. Cock so shamo is a cor corruption of Siam, um, where it's believed to have originated. And it came to Japan in the late 16th or early 17th century. It's very large. It can be up to two feet tall. 
and um, very muscular, as you can see. Um, but as you can see in the, the other slide, there's also a bantam version on the right, which is looks like a baby, but that's actually a bantam shamo. There's like seven breeds of different types of shamo chickens. Um, and, um, and it's also um, an another, I'm oh, sorry, I lost my place. Um, yeah. Um, another cockfighting breed is the Satsuma Dori, which you can see here. And this, as the previous slides probably made obvious, is a, is a crossbreed between the Shamo and the Shokoku and another um, Japanese bird called the Minohiki. Now the text on the right is, um, you'll have to look very carefully, but one of the unique things about the cockfighting in Satsuma is it's the only place in Japan that I found that use spurs on the chickens. And those are like knives so that the, that, that resulted in a fatality. Otherwise, apparently, um, most Japanese cockfights did not end, necessarily end in a fatality. Okay, so um, the Satsuma Dori also has a small comb on the top, you can see, and wattles, which was um, better protected the bird during fighting. Um, and then also, because it seems in counterintuitive, um, bantam chickens, oh yeah, yeah, there's a bantam chicken. So the bantam chickens were also sometimes used for cockfighting because they can be aggressive. Um, so the bantam most associated with Japan is this one. It's called a chabo. And um, these are believed to have come from chamba. Most bantams are miniaturizations of larger chickens, but the chabo and the koshiamo are naturally occurring dwarf chickens. Um, the reason that I had this slide in twice is if you look to the right, it's two actors um, getting ready to participate in a cockfight. And I had a really nice quote about um, from Ihara Saikaku about actors in their cockfights, but I cut it for time. But that's why that's there. Okay, so there's the chavo and um, and the point of all this is that cockfighting really brought chickens from the religious to the secular realm and was a strong motive for introducing changes to birds that might enhance their fighting capabilities. So um, then, of course, you, I started to wonder what, where were these chickens being raised? And farmers, of course, had reasons to keep chickens besides raising game cocks. They were alarm cocks, clocks. It was thought that they could predict the weather, like if they built their nests early in the day or stayed out late, the nest, the next day would be bad weather. Um, chickens also help with pest control by eating insects. And in the end Edo period, if not early, um, earlier, chicken guano was used as fertilizer. So according to um, a book called the Honcho Shokan, which was published in 1697. Um, the best guano was gathered in the 12th month, and ukoke guano was especially potent. Now, the ukoke is another interesting chicken. Um, you can see it is black, and um, it has five toes when all other chickens have four and it has feathered feet and the feathers, the barbules don't, don't connect so they can't fly at all. It's, it stays fluffy like a chicken. And I put just another picture so you didn't have to look at the dead bird all the time. This is by uh, Mori Sosen of 1807 showing the same ukoke. So um, we'll come back to them again. According to the um, Nogyo Zensho, which was published in 1697, um, this was the standard work on ag agriculture well into the 19th century. Um, no house should ever be without dogs or chickens. Um, it warns that large flocks were difficult to care for and required a lot of grain, and that there were large flocks on some farms, but most just had a rooster and a few hens. Some sources suggest that it was normal to have a flock of 30 to 50 birds by the late Edo period, and by the 18th century, certain chicken raising regions like Kaga were sending chickens to other areas. So what was the purpose of raising all these chickens? Um, there's sort of a false perception that chickens and eggs were only rarely eaten, and thus chickens were not raised or bred for consumption. 
So this might be an extension of idealized views of the Japanese relationship with nature, or it might be a conflation of attitudes about other domesticated animals like cattle and horses, which were also consumed, but only very rarely. Um, since consumption is the main reason chickens are kept today, this premise is kind of worth examining in detail. So one significant motivator was pharmacological consumption. If um, domestication caused physical changes, which was also a part that I cut, but the main difference between a domesticated chicken and that red jungle fowl is that um, wild birds only produce eggs in season, whereas we all know domesticated chickens can produce them at any time. So um, domestication can cause physical changes, um, but one aim of medicine has been a particular form of control of life, namely the restoration of a state of health when normal function is deserved, disturbed. So if we look at it from this perspective, diet and nutrition are a form of engineering and govern attitudes about food and prescriptions around it. So both chickens and their eggs have a long been believed to have medicinal value in Japan. Um, there's a mid 14th century book on treating battle wounds, for example, that has recipes for medicines that included the juice extracted from chicken viscera, powdered chicken eggshell, and beaten egg to promote healing. Um, according to the, ah, that's, that's another festival where they avoid eggs. That's, the chicken that I wanted to show you before, the black chicken, and this is the book that we're supposed to be on. So according to the Toryo Sensor Ryo Taizen, which is the complete manual of cuisine of our school from 1714, um, it says that eggs were good for stopping diarrhea, eye pains, poor hearing, petrified blood, and passing the placenta after childbirth, reducing melancholy, and helping people weep from weight loss as well as fever. Eating with onions and garlic were to be avoided because chicken and onions apparently causes inflammation. And the ukoke, that black chicken, was believed to have special medicinal powers. And that's true even today. If you, there's uh, egg producers in Japan that sell those ukoke eggs and they cost like three times or four times what a regular egg costs. Um, there are a number of regional and folk beliefs around consuming chickens and eggs, too. Um, in Akko, it was believed if you ate a coxcomb, you would wake up early and it would cure bedwetting. In Nara, it was common knowledge that if you ate chicken liver or gallbladder, you would die. Um, my father ate a lot of chicken liver, so I don't know. Um, in Nagasaki, it was believed that eating a chicken's first egg of the year would prevent palsy. Mistreating eggs by urinating or straddling an egg would cause women's sicknesses, while stepping on an eggshell could cause leukemia. Throwing an eggshell into the fire could cause your eyes to go bad. Stepping on one could give you a child that looked like a chicken or a difficult birth. Um, the supernatural powers of chickens brought by avoiding their consumption can be seen in religious institutions. So that's what this is about. In Washinomiya Shrine in Tochigi Prefecture, um, that was founded in 1808, and it was known for curing coughs because when the second Kamakura Shogun, Minamoto um, Yogi Ie, um, who was um, 1182 to 1204, he, when he had whooping cough, his mother, Hojo Masako, um, eschewed eating chickens and eggs and went there to pray, after which the young Shogun was cured. So even today, one is supposed to avoid eating chicken and eggs before worshiping there. Um, the introduction of Buddhism did affect attitudes toward meat consumption, but perhaps not as much as generally supposed. Euphemisms were common to minimize the act of eating meat. Horse was called cherry, deer was called maple, boar was peony, and chicken was oak or kashiwa. And that's a name that's still used for chicken in Kansai. So you linguists have at it. Um, other chickens might be labeled, just be called like pheasant or rabbit because, to sort of overcome the biases against eating a domestic animal. Um, when Once war, warrior rule came in um, after 1185, meat eating does seem to have increased across the board in general. And this only increased as the standard of 
of living improved over the Edo period. So the development of trade entrepôts in the second half of the 16th century may have stimulated wider consumption as foreigners of all nationalities introduced their eating habits. Nevertheless, the fact that there were enough chickens on hand to provide frequent gifts to Westerners suggests that they were already consumed, even if they were as Portuguese sea captain Al um, Jorge Alvarez complained in 1547, very tough to eat. It appears that the Dutch ate like massive amounts of chickens. In a cost-saving measure uh, in uh, 1658, Oberhoft, that's factory head, um, Zacharias Wagenar ordered that the merchants be served chicken only three times a week to reduce current consumption of 50 to 60 chickens weekly. This is like 15 guys. Um, according to the Honcho Shokan, which I mentioned before, the chickens kept for eating were jidori and tomaru, but the best for eating were yellow hens um, followed by the ukoke. Um, tomaru are, are also a greenish black long crowing variety with a baritone two tone, -tone voice that is regarded as exceptionally beautiful. Um, excavations have shown that there were special fondness for chickens in Chiyoda Castle where the shogun resided. And similarly, large quantities of um, chicken bones were found in an archeological dig in the samurai quarters of Matsuyama Castle in Ehime pre Prefecture. And shamo, that big cockfighting chicken, was considered a delicacy in Edo. It was a popular sort of stamina food for sumo wrestlers um, revolutionary Sakamoto Ryoma was waiting to eat shamo stew when assassins burst into his lodgings and ended his life, so he never got his treat. Um, and in Satsuma, after the um, sharp spurs that I showed you before were affixed to the um, mortal wound of the, the once the, the loser was mortally wounded, he was immediately cut up and thrown into a cooking pot with daikon and miso. miso. Um, and it's called Satsuma Jiro, and that's still eaten in Japan. And chicken eggs were consumed even more frequently and more widely than meat, because in all pre-modern societies, meat was a luxury, um, partly because they were cheaper, but especially after the idea circulated that an egg did not count as a living thing. By the Shotoku era, which was 1711 to 1715, there were wholesalers of eggs in Edo and Osaka. In 1785, a cookbook just for eggs was published called um, Tamago Hyakuchi, which is like a hundred interesting ways to make eggs. Um, onigiri was with fried egg, onigiri rice ball with fried egg was a popular snack for theater goers in Edo. Uh, it was also, as you see today, put on sushi. Um, in Edo, a hard boiled egg cost about the same as a bowl of plain soba. By the 19th century, there were even hard boiled egg hawkers walking around the streets selling eggs. So uh, I think it's pretty clear that they were beaten, eaten. And humans were not even the only ones consuming chicken eggs. Um, books for, on caring for cage birds also recommended chicken eggs as a food source for some birds. Um, similarly, the advent of the Portuguese, with the advent of the Portuguese, we see the increase of eggs in snacks and sweets. Missionaries used sweets to help persuade potential converts. Like, uh, hey kid, you want some candy? Uh, Castada, which is, oh, these are all cookbooks with chicken and egg recipes. Um, and then I wanted to show you, this is um, a picture of a bird seller. And the interesting thing is you see the chickens walking around in the front, but there's also chickens in the cages too. Um, the, the, the butcher of birds on the left looks like it's doing wild ducks or something. They don't look like chickens. And then there's also cage birds in the back. So um, that was that. So that's Castella on the left. Um, it's still a specialty of Nagasaki, but you can get it anywhere in Japan. And this is probably the best known example of an egg-dependent foreign introduction. Uh, specialty shops selling Castella opened as early as 1587, and a lot of other sweets based around this idea um, developed. And then another sort of interesting one is a confectionery known as um, Keidan Somen, chicken egg noodles. And um, this it's, it consists entirely of egg yolks that are dipped into boiling sugar and is copied after a Portuguese confection. So these early examples were a luxury, but perhaps not so much because of the eggs, but because of the sugar. 
However, sugar prices fell through the Edo period and an increased standard of living led to new treats. Um, imagawa yaki, which um, were named for their first point of, um, of sale in a street stand near Imagawa Bridge are still a popular sort of street food. Um, and for those of you who know Japan, may be wondering why these Imagawa yaki are ginormous. Um, that's because apparently this is actually on Brick Lane in London, but it was the best picture I could find. So, um, but it looks more or less the same in Japan. They just tend to be smaller. Okay. So in modern, early modern Japan, you can see egg was consumed more than chicken, but both were, you know, disappeared down the, the gullets of Japanese consumers. So um, academic discussions of chicken breeds which is kind of the whole idea behind aviculture, um, seem to have become as an offshoot of Materia Medica. Um, Daimyo Hota Ma um, Mas Masaatsu created this book called um, Kanbun Kimpu, which was this lush exploration of bird life with detailed drawings and accurate descriptions, of, of which you can see some here. And um, he discusses the Tomaru, the Shamo, the ukoke, Dutch chickens, and um, several kinds of bantams and uh, frizzled birds, which that's what a frizzled chicken is. It's another mutation in which the the feathers are are weird like that. It's called frizzled. So um, this probably influenced Hatamoto and castle guard Mori Bayan, who also offered, authored a book called Bayan Kimpu, and he also shows um, that's the Dutch chicken, the big one on the left, and the one on the right you can see is a bantam. Um, and, and you can see the drawings are very detailed and realistic. Um, probably the most detailed in this um, genre was uh, called Kaiko Dori and, um, by Sato Chudo. And he was employed by the Mito domain. He differentiated 16 different kinds of chickens in most cases providing alternate names, how they were eaten in, in the region they originated from, their origins in Japan, and a number of other facts. He notes three different chickens developed specifically for Dutch traders who always complained that the chickens that they were getting were tough and un unappetizing. So some ch chickens seem to have been bred for reasons that were neither religious nor nutritional. Um, Chabo, the, the bantams, and other um, Chabo and other bands, um, um, especially the Uzrao, um, usually fall into this category of pets because they're smaller and cuter and easier to take care of. So the Uzrao, as you can see from this picture, um, picture have a, a gene mutation in which the tail bud does not grow, so they don't have a tail. Um, and in Japanese, it middle, literally means um, tail like a quail. So um, there's a local village tradition that says that they began when a dog bit the tail off. And while sometimes oral traditions are revealing, we know that this one is not true. Um, breeding rumpless chickens, which is the English description of this kind of chicken, rumpless, um, was probably for their oddity, although some theorize that they, they might have been bred for cockfighting because the lack of tail might leave them less exposed. Nevertheless, the two best known books on caring for pet birds, um, that's called Yo Yobuko and Momochidori, don't contain any advice about chickens, suggesting that for at least most people, pet keeping was not the most common motivation for keeping them, despite what is often suggested. So some chickens were bred specifically for their color or their feathers. Um, the Onagadori, was supposedly bred to provide extra long feathers for spears carried on the annual marches to Edo. Um, because they had military significance, they were kept secret and were little known outside of Tosa until the end of the Edo period. And they're first described in this, what you can see here in 1859 booklet of oddities called um, Shohinko by Nishimura Hiroyoshi. And this is believed to be the first um, picture of Onagadori. Uh, and then I have the one on the left is from Popular Mechanics of 1913, and I just love the way that they, they put it in there. And the one on the right is a modern one that they breed. They have these very long tails. So um, 
This is perhaps the most extreme example of chicken breeds that evolved in the Edo period as a result of conscious engineering to satisfy specific ends. So um, to conclude, the natural monuments were not natural in the sense that they exist without human intervention. Even if a mutation occurred naturally, as in the Uzurao, with its missing tail bud, as a breed, it only exists because humans purposely reproduced it. If adopting nature to human ends represents harmony with nature, then the cliche does hold true. The Japanese chicken materially changed through the new breeds of chickens that accompanied the increase of foreign trade. Exposure to new foodways arguably influenced diet, and these changes were supported by the specific historical context of the Edo period. A general increase in the standard of living and the leisure and disposable income that accompanied it brought a higher demand for chickens for gaming, eating, egg production, material culture, and pet keeping. As the demand became more varied and complex, breeding practices responded to engineer specific traits in each chicken breed. This knowledge had new ways to circulate as increased literacy supported the creation of written texts that explained the best practices in raising chickens. The rich biography of the chicken in the Edo period is a monument not to unvarnished nature, but to the cultural life of pre-modern Japan. Thank you. Thank you, Marta. Thank you very much. There was, a, there was such an interesting talk. I had no idea. Was, because of your expertise, I was, a, I was thinking that, I was imagining that the Dutch had something to do with it, but uh, uh, in fact, they were just there to eat the chicken. <laughs> just complaining about how tough. Just complaining about how tough the uh, ones that they were getting, because the the jidori, the the original ones that came over in ancient times, were very small and didn't have as much meat. But there are certain breeds like the tomato that were specifically bred even in the Edo period to produce more delicious eating chickens. Fantastic. I was wondering something before passing the floor to uh, to other questions, and, I, and I'm sure there there are a few. Um, you were talking about you insisted a lot on on cock fighting, and uh, which is something we have a lot of so uh, in Java from a yes. very early period on. And I was wondering, uh, did this come with the same amount? Of, and you talked also about petting those chickens, but um, but having chicken and, uh, well roosters as pets. Did this come with as much as that attention as it came in Java, where you have you would have, you would have rooster champions uh, given a lot of attention, bathed, um, you know, massaged, given you know very specific food, etc. There's you know 16th century Portuguese uh, sources mentioning that you know the royal court of Tuban, for example, you would have collections of elephant collection of horses and roosters. You know, they, were 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 um, roosters and chicken generally as important as that in, in the hierarchy of animals, pet animals. I think that the ones in ancient times that were used in the imperial house probably were because they said they perfumed the wings and yeah. painted the talons red. And but by the time it becomes common in gambling, I haven't found a lot of sources, and I have been looking. Um, and I looked at books on gambling, I looked on in all kinds of books, and I have not found a lot of sources that give a lot of specifics. But at least in that actor's quote that I caught, um, it appears perhaps not as elaborate as that, but they did take care of them because it was like an investment. And, um, and so by using these like imported birds to breed cockfighting specific chickens and whatnot, there was some care taken. But I, I don't have a lot of very specific information about what was going on. No manual of caretaking. I haven't found one yet. At least one did not survive. That did, uh, and like I went through those books about taking care of birds and uh, like the ones for pet birds did not have anything about chickens. Hey, do, do we have questions? I'm sure Jiri has a question on knives. Yeah, not on knives. <laughs> not on the spurs? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Quite like Ellen, uh, I cannot help uh, 
see many uh, abundant uh, you know links to Southeast Asia. Yeah. You mentioned uh, champa chickens. Uh, yeah. You mentioned chicken from Siam. As far as I remember from my reading on domestication of chicken, the earliest evidence is really from Thailand, basically from a Bronze Age site called Ban Chiang, if I'm not mistaken, where they interpret bone, uh, bone finds yeah. as domestic, uh, I mean bones of domestic uh, jungle fowl, basically. Anyway, uh, it's quite it's quite uh, understandable that, that the movement in this in this in this um, development of possibilities of, of, of chicken was from Southeast Asia to Japan, probably also from Japan to Southeast Asia, but we don't have many many evidence no. for that. And my question would pertain to cox first, definitely, because in Javanese, in Balinese culture and in other cultures yeah. in the region, Southeast Asia, you use them basically to kill the loser because it's still a kind of sacrifice. So basically it's blood sacrifice in Bali, Quite straightforward with the conical spirits, the basically lower, lower, yeah. lower demonic uh, spirits, and uh, the winner will lose his chick uh, because it would be killed ultimately. Sometimes it survives, and then it's a little bit like pamper the game to be battle fit for the next uh, combat. But in many cases, and in the past, it was basically the rule that the, that the, that the animal died and and there was much betting going on on these on these contests as well so people were somehow basically interested to see the clear result so when one animal dies then the result is really obvious and uh, these cockspurs are really as ellen says sometimes artful objects they are really uh, made from wonderful kind of steel and there is all kinds of craftsmanship or art artisanship invested in, in, in mm. the making of cockspurs and the boxes that are used for cockspurs. Mm. They are also very ornamental and precious, uh, lovely objects, if you can use the word for a kind of weapon, or box for the weapon, basically. And my question would be, have you found any explanation why Japanese avoided the use of cockspurs? Uh... <coughs> No, but conversely, um, King in Satsuma, which is that's um, in the most southernmost part of Kyushu. So Japan sometimes the the northern influence, like from Korea and China, is the most emphasized. But from the south, there's definitely a strong Southeast mm -hmm. Asian influence. So to me, that explains why in Satsuma they would use them, where in other places they did not. Okay. So. Um, Maybe someone can answer if um, in China they used the spurs or not, but because it was introduced from China, that may have originally may have influenced why they did not. But um, if you look at this, um, wait a minute, it won't go backwards. It doesn't want me anymore. No, that's that's it. I wanted to get the um, actor picture back with the cockfighting. Uh, so. One of the few descriptions that I have been found is that they used like a, a ring, like a kind of like a sumo ring. Okay. And you can see that in that picture. So even though that's sort of dr dramatized of actors all dressed up with a uh, a woman judge, uh, you know, because it was for fun. But um, what I found was that that the the chicken just had to be submissive or be knocked out of the ring okay. was the comment was one common way so i don't know if it was buddhist ideas or if the way it was i have found so little literature on cockfighting i i have been studying japan for 30 years and i didn't even know they had cockfighting until i did this uh, that's actually a good point this buddhist connection because it would make sense uh, i mean japan was buddhist society to some to some level at least in the medieval period, right? As I understand it, so oh, yeah. there must be a kind of avoidance of bloody, bloody, you know, spilling of blood, basically. That's obviously it's interesting to see that it's ritualized in another way, as you say, as a sumo ring. It makes perfect sense for a 
how to internalize it in, in the Japanese culture, basically. I mean, the bloody sacrifice that was quite clearly initially at the, at the onset of cockfighting, because cockfighting was world spread. You have it in ancient Greece, yeah. you know, much earlier than in Java, of course. I mean, for Java, we have early evidence, but it's still later than your evidence. Our evidence is basically ninth century texts, the earliest evidence. No doubt it, it was there before, but we don't have when the first evidence appears, it's already matured, you know, matured phenomenon, these, these cockfights, because it's <clears throat> the earliest inscriptions tell us that cockfights are a very common, very common event on, on SEMA uh, ritual festivals. That's, that's basically a festival to establish uh, tax free or a village that was, uh, that was relieved from paying taxes to the king and on the other side, it was forced to pay the same tax to the Buddhist monastery or Hindu temple that was built on the on the, on the Sima, it's called Sima, mm -hmm. from Sanskrit boundary, on this on this on this community, uh, on this I mean, the community obviously benefited from a Buddhist temple rather than paying the taxes to the king. That's why that's why the phenomenon was widespread. But the point is that. Many of these uh, Sima communities are really rural communities. We can pinpoint on the map even today the places, and cockfighting was very common even in these places. That's why I suppose that the phenomenon is ancient in Java, but our earliest evidence is just written evidence from the ninth century. And you mentioned quite early evidence from sixth century. Uh, 492. Oh yeah, that's 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 much earlier. Well, anyway, it's interesting to see how in different cultures it's yeah internalized in different ways. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's one of the interesting things about chickens that I didn't bring up in the paper, but what makes them exceptionally worthy of study is because even though they are believed to originate in Southeast Asia, they follow human beings all over the world. So chickens exist everywhere, even places like Easter Island because they come with human beings. So they are also sort of a tracker of human migration. And, and because roosters are aggressive, um, cockfighting is probably sort of one of those things that develop independently True. in different places. It's not necessarily uh, something that has to spread. Yeah, and Tom mentioned in his uh, contribution few bird names that were that can be traced uh, uh, initial Austronesian chicken is certainly among them it's this manuk basically in many Austronesian languages manuk means bird it's just the general term for the bird but it also means chicken more specifically and it's widespread so yeah it traveled with people from earliest Austronesian uh, spread out or colonization up to the Pacific and the Eastern Islands, certainly. On that point, um, just I had a more um, general question about that you mentioned that Manuk was the term for bird food or also for chicken. I was wondering when in the, the sources you're looking at, um, do they have this kind of term for chicken? I mean, is there an awareness that all these different breeds are related? Um, or are they just called this type of bird and this type of bird? Um, no, there's definitely an awareness that they were related. So or, originally you just had the, the two breeds. You had the Jidori, which are the ancient original imports, and then you had the Shokoku, the black and white one that came from China. And um, in terms of language, this is also in the longer paper, but the oldest term is, is um, like, Kake, and Kake is apparently from just just like he, Tom said. I don't know if he's still here, but uh, because of the way that they sound. And then um, the modern term, which was used from fairly ancient times, is um, Niwatori, and that literally means um, like garden bird. And that developed from um, Makura Kotoba, like a poetic language, to indicate um, you know it was just sort of a a beautiful way to call them in contrast to wild birds. And so one of the interesting things also about chickens is that 
for example, um, wild ducks and wild geese have a different name from domesticated ducks and domesticated geese. But there's only one general term for chicken. Okay. So I think that there may have been like feral chickens, but they were always domesticated. Um, That's this relates to the how we define birds, and in this case, how we define chickens. And it's, it, it seems that yeah, chickens, there's something special about them. They're all, they have a kind of more delimited area, right? Than other types of. Well, birds. They, they're domesticated, but they seem to exist in, a, in their own space. Um, that's different from domest domesticated cows and domesticated horses. And, and horses also had, uh, you know, great religious meaning, which is why they are the number one Haniwa, those clay things. But chickens also were different from cows and, and ducks and geese. And, uh, and, and Japan didn't domesticate very many animals. They didn't really have domesticated pigs or they just had the wild ones. Maybe, maybe around the, the, you know, the Chinese and Dutch port, they might have had some, but for the most part, they did not eat pork, right? Just wild, wild boar. Can, can I suggest that you just read a couple of minutes from chicken? Is that okay? Oh, yeah. You're in charge. You're the chair. <laughs> so it's because it's my book. Is Gregory Ford here? No, I don't, I don't think. Oh, so he's really not big. giving his turn. No. Okay. You're not so we're behind you. Yeah. Okay. I do. Let's I double check, but yes, we have so more from him. Yeah, so we definitely can take more questions. Um, yeah. Can we? No. No? Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, this talk is really wonderful. Like I learned a lot. Um, I just have one question in my mind. So concerning the relationship between the the real birds and the supernatural birds, um, well, just one idea in my mind. Is that possible that um, the enriched uh, variety of the chicken birds somehow um, somehow you know like inspired the artists? Who in Edo period who painted the phoenix to include like more like chicken kind of uh, features in their paintings because I, when I check the um, some phoenix paintings of Edo period I feel like mm, they look like chicken <laughs> so I don't know is that possible like in um, this my hypothesis <laughs> um, well I think that's po possible because um, like. Even though the, the very long tailed chicken was not widely known, there were other, there were some other breeds that had very luxurious plumage. And you know, artists were always inspired by what they knew. I mean they had the they couldn't create this out of nothing, so that I would imagine that they took stuff that they knew and elaborated on it. It's like there's a mythological animal called a baku. Mm -hmm. um, that eats it's, it eats dreams, but mm -hmm. a lot of times you'll see it misidentified as an elephant because it's got a long long nose, or you'll see it misidentified as mm -hmm. uh, like when I see captions, mm -hmm. you'll see it misidentified as uh, an elephant or a pig because it kind of looks like both of those, but it's oh. neither. It's an imaginary animal. And is it also bird? No, that one's oh, that, that's, that one's not a bird. But the, oh, the phoenix, I mean, the phoenix probably comes in from uh, China again. Mm -hmm. But um, but how Japanese artists interpret it was probably influenced by what they saw around mm -hmm. them. And is it is it true that actually in Edo period there there were more um, kinds of breeds like and the chicken. Um, Right. Yeah, so mm -hmm. so you showed us a, a, the chart of the yeah. 17 natural yeah, monuments. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah so uh, probably some of these things were developing in local areas mm -hmm. without notice. Mm -hmm. But the consciousness, so one of the things I kind of, because I had to cut so much, so one of the things that I wanted to show with those luxurious um, works by academics at the end is this consciousness 
of different breeds of chickens. Because mm. the whole idea of a breed is a relatively modern notion, right? Mm. That things yeah. develop in small localities and develop characteristics or bred mm. to have characteristics. Mm. But the idea of a breed is a fairly modern notion. Mm. Like even dog breeds only start officially in the 19th century. Mm. So um, I just wanted to show this awareness of all these different kinds of chickens because that is sort of a mental and intellectual oh, yeah, development yeah, yeah. That's true. That's important. Yeah. into into specifying these chickens. So exactly when some of these these things started is a little difficult to, to know because you know some farmer had some good chickens, shared some eggs with his neighbor, mm -hmm. you know, we don't know what, what's going on. Because they didn't they were probably illiterate. Yeah, thank you. In this vein, just to continue the, the idea, right? So, so I think we're talking, you're referring to this uh, the scientific idea of birds that we're dealing overall versus the local systems of knowledge that classify right. birds mm -hmm. um, or types of animals. Exactly. Um, so like the yeah. earliest texts just talk about like red bird, yellow bird, mm -hmm. and then you start to have specific names mm -hmm. for kinds of chickens. And I, I go into it in more detail, but I figured for oral presentation, for people that don't know the text, it's just going to be gobbledygook. So cooked. So I got a little compressed. So, so for Japan, this happens in the end of period, right? And yes. So I'm thinking, I'll, in my paper, I'll talk about uh, some theological, some dictionaries that start to start to, to be put together. Um, I mean, it, it seems quite late for for that to happen in Japan compared to other other linguistic traditions, but I don't know if well, I mean, I mean they differentiate, but the they're very it's very crude, right? So it's like red kind of chicken, yellow kind of chicken. They're very crude. Um, even in the West, if you compare ornithology to like botany or other taxonomic structures, ornithology develops relatively late. Uh, so it's not to like Buffon in the in the late 18th century or so that you really start to. Um, I mean, you have Linnaeus, but but ornithology as as a scientific practice developed a lot later than other branches, even in the West. I don't know exactly why. Maybe because birds fly around a lot and they're hard to hard to track. I don't know, but um, I do know that it, it developed later. I see that the earliest ornithology develops with the gun, basically, because they never cared about bird watching. And if you check the early European sources, I mean, 19th century, basically, you shoot your bird and then you check it, have it stuffed, probably, or yeah. skinned, and that's the early ornithology in Europe. Yeah. But that's still, I mean, I worked in a museum. The the collections, the 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 natural history collections were drawers of dead birds. It's, yeah, I mean, yeah. it's kind of. But how else are you going to study all the characteristics? They they don't sit still. I couldn't even get my kids to sit still. So yeah. I don't know how you get a bird. Purely descriptive. <laughs> no interest in life of the bird, probably at that time. Well, I mean, but that's also like how natural history is performed. That's why the. But I mean, those specif I mean, as unappealing as that is to us now, some some species we only have knowledge of because of those yes. those collections. Yes. You, said, you said it came with uh, pharmacology. Uh, I think the no, the very no materia medica. Yeah. Pharmacological, <laughs> yeah, pharmacological perspective. perspective yes. Yeah, interest. Yeah. I think that was part of it. So, so you see, like botany happening earlier, and then after that, um, and certainly, um, I mean, I don't know if um, chickens is one of those things that's also universal medicine, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't know if a lot of medicines also came in from China and and. Um, Probably some of the beliefs about the upoke that came from China, but the chicken as medicine is probably another one of those things that um, 
just happen everywhere, right? And the idea of pharmacology is broad, very broad. Yeah. It includes also mentioned paradise birds come up with yeah. that, that same nutrition. I really did the Japanese use plumage or feathers in one or other way because Oh, yeah. Quite surprisingly, in Jao, was all this tradition of cockfighting and keeping, you know, keeping, especially in the elite circles, just for joy, keeping uh, choice, choice uh, chicken, uh, cocks, basically. There was little tradition of, of using chicken feathers in Java. I mean, like we, in Europe, you, you use them to stuff your, uh, your pillows. Of course, it was not Southeast Asian tradition because it yeah. would be uh, uncomfortable in the humid tropical conditions. Okay. So, did Japanese yes. have a kind of this tradition? So, I mentioned the pole arms, but again, for time, I cut some of the other things. But they were used for um, like whisks and feather brushes okay. to clean things. And um, they were used uh, like for, uh, there was a, a game. Like kind of like badminton, oh, they yeah, hit a, yeah. um, a thing. But yeah, they they were used for that. Um, they were used to decorate certain things. It wasn't. Um, they didn't also did not stuff because okay. okay. uh, it didn't. I mean, same. I mean, Japan is mostly superhuman as well. So. Okay. Yeah. The divine status. <laughs> <laughs> but there were some. I did look into uses of feathers because I, I did another chapter about peacocks. Yeah. So. That's another story completely different. Yeah. yeah. In Indonesia, kemojing? Kemojing is the, 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 the feather duster. Yeah. The use of feather duster is also a Chinese thing. Right? Okay, yeah. It's not the same. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I wanted to thank you also before passing the microphone to, uh, to Asan as a Two more questions. Um, I didn't. I didn't understand coming from France. I didn't understand how chicken broth, which is just a soup in France, was actually considered pharmacy here. Right? I mean, they sell it in those little containers, and then you get to the, whatever you get, strength, or, right? And uh, so I got. I thanks for for addressing that as well. Now I understand the, the history of it. Yeah, uh -huh. it's, it has no history. Here. Um, Asa has a question. Just before giving you the mic, uh, <laughs> Lydia on by email has um, suggested that we look a little bit more into the question and the questions in the um, in the chat, box. In the chat yeah, box. Thank you, because there were questions that were not addressed. For Q and A, yeah, there. So I guess Andrea has uh, seen this by now. Very sorry, Lydia. Yeah, I sent. You did send them to Lydia. The okay. Uh, Lydia's comment. I sent them to Lydia. Okay. After I saw it. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay, but uh, maybe you already talked about it. Maybe I missed some information. I have two simple questions. Okay. Uh, first. Uh, you said that Japanese people have uh, many varieties of chicken. Uh, which one is the famous chicken for Edo era? And uh, maybe comparing today. Okay. So. So. There are a famous uh, chicken. Yeah. Or era, and comparing today, there is the same or there is a different kind of chicken. So today, um, in the after um, Japan, you know, opened, um, the government noticed like how much smaller Japanese people were compared to Westerns. Like the average Japanese man was like, I think just over four feet. They were very small because. They didn't eat a lot of protein, and especially they didn't have a lot of. I think more than the meat, I think it's the calcium, because apparently because it's um, volcanic soil, it's calcium poor, 
So even though vegetables have less calcium than like the ones we have in the West, my understanding. So the only sources of calcium, because they didn't do dairy either, were, were like eating small whole fish. So anyway, the point being that the government wanted to improve the citizenry and, and um, there's like a whole new thing that happens in the 19th century of pushing meat eating and new breeds are imported like the um, the leghorn, some American breeds um, to produce more meat. And um, that changes the chickens completely. So that's why they made these Edo period chickens, all these older breeds of chickens that I had in that chart um, and all the ones that I showed pictures of, they're all made um, what they call national monuments. So they're real attempts to preserve them as some sort of pure breeding stock in Japan. So um, I think today most, like if you go to the supermarket, you'll see things that are sold as jidori, which is that ancient first, first ancient breeds. And they still market that as like a good kind of meat if you go to the regular supermarket. Whereas I, I never knew about most of these other ones till I started this research. I just knew there were like some weird chickens and I'm like, what are these things and why do they exist? <laughs> so um, I'm hoping that I sort of answer those questions in here. And, uh, the second question is, uh, did the Japanese people use chicken for the ritual ceremony? Like, uh, in your, in your slide, uh, show the, the egg. black, the black uh, yeah. chicken. In Japanese, we uh, we knew the chamani, chamani chicken. The skin, the egg, uh, even the blood is black. The chamani chicken is for uh, they use for black magic. Uh, there is a how about the Japanese people? Um, I didn't come across anything quite like that. They're definitely used um, in rituals like at certain shrines. Um, so like I showed that picture with the eggs. That's kind of this elaborate ritual where they show that they don't eat the eggs. And and you know what a tengu is? I think that might be uh, from the Garuda. Mm -hmm. Some people say it's a, it's a bird, man bird that's like a messenger from the gods and they come behind and like threaten them and tell them to eat the eggs and they're supposed to not eat the eggs. Um, there's another um, shrine, I, I have all this that I cut it because I suppose it gets repetitions. but I just wanted to show it wasn't, you know, just one weird place that it's, these things are scattered all over Japan. Um, but there's like another shrine where they used to have cockfights, but because cockfighting was outlawed, um, now they, they still have a ceremony where they like come in, they hold the chickens up and the, the, the two roosters look at each other and they just hold them up and then they step outside of the ring and that's the whole ceremony. But that's uh, that shrine is like where a lot of people involved in the chicken industry go to worship um, and they do that. And I should check into this actually. There's probably um, some place where they do a, a a Kuyo, like a Buddhist ceremony to apologize. Because I know the ivory carvers do one. Um, they go, they have these Buddhist ceremonies sort of to honor the things that sort of died for whatever you're using. There's like ones for tools. There's ones, there's the ivory carvers have one for elephants. Mm -hmm. And there must be one for chickens somewhere. I have to look into that. I, I didn't think of that. So they're definitely used as, I mean, cockfighting was originally part of ritual. So um, they're definitely ritualistic meanings. Actually, the eggs are also uh, quite uh, quite intriguing uh, object of ritual in Indonesia. I mean, the Sima ceremony I was talking about uh, that we know from old Japanese inscriptions. Mm. It's actually centered on the ritual act when a kind of priest smashes one chicken egg on the stone that's uh, commemorative of the of the ceremony, oh. and uh, it's 
it's rich in all kinds of uh, cosmological traditions because in Hindu, Buddhist, Javanese civilization, as well as in basically all other parts of Indianized uh, Asia, mm -hmm. uh, cosmology was based on the worldview of uh, egg as a kind of container that basically that's that's Hindu Puranic concept that the world consists of several layers that are encased in one huge cosmic egg. And this smashing of the egg was meant as a kind of, okay, you destroy the old order. The old order was that the village pays taxes to the king, you smash the egg, and the yolk would never come back to its container, basically, once you smash it, right? So it was believed that you uh, cut up uh, completely all old ways, and now the taxes are paid to the whatever temple or uh, monastery. So basically, the egg was used in multiple ways in ritual in Java, and it's been used in multiple ways until very modern times. So um, maybe it would be nice to make a kind of comparative study between two cultures like Japan and, and, and Java or Thailand or whatever. So basically, there must be some shared shared uh, oh. sh shared concepts. Yeah. Oh. But and uh, you know the egg is also another one of those universal symbols. Yeah. Easter eggs, yeah. uh, renewal. You, you can find it in Judaism. Um, True. Yeah. I think it's it's one of those symbolic things that. But it would be interesting to do that. Do you want to do that? No. <laughs> Because that would involve me using a lot of sources that I don't know anything about. And on this note, on our limits, on our, our limits of our yes. studies, I suggest if there's no other, if there isn't any other question, that we close the session. And you can and, always ask me later. And uh, we know where you are. <laughs>